Hello and welcome to this week's YouTube video. Today we're going over the top chess tactics and strategies to win at chess. And I'm going to be going over three tiers of this. Um, first is beginner, then intermediate, and then advanced. Now, beginner is mostly going to be doing uh, basic tactics. And the first three examples of this, um, I'm just going to show you right now. Now, a fork is probably one of the most common tactics in chess, and it, it happens at all levels, and it mainly happens with a singular piece, and that piece is mainly the knight. Um, that's just because the knight is very tricky, and it's just hard to see knight forks, um, even for advanced players. But yeah, I'm just gonna be going over an example of the Jababa London, and honestly, this is an entire idea of the Jababa London, um, or one of the main ideas, I should say. Um, and essentially, which this does get played a lot at lower levels, um, against the two knights, against the Baba is very bad for the specific reason that there is a fork on the c7 square. The knight forks the king and the rook, and you win almost instantly by a forced winning of material. On to the next tactic, a pin. Now, a pin is also a very common tactic. This happens at almost all parts of the game. It can happen in the opening, it can happen in the middle game, and it can happen into the end game. But in this example, I'm going to be showing you uh, an occurrence that happens in the opening, and this is against the Karl Khan. You play the main line um, it takes, and after knight to d7, I believe this is called the Karpov variation. They're preparing to go knight f6, and they don't want to double their pawns, but you have a very tricky move here which has been popular in recent years, queen to e2. Now this is a great move, um, just in general, but uh, it's even better if you play this in bullet, um, just to be honest, because there is a very special hidden tactic here. If the opponent goes along with their idea and plays knight g to f6, most importantly knight g to f6, play knight d to f6, they're completely fine. There is a very cool tactic here. You have knight 2d6 checkmate and the reason this is checkmate is because there is a pin to the king on this pawn which stops it from recapturing the knight and notice there is no squares for the king to run to because all the pieces around it are covered by its own pieces so it is a smothered mate um, which is also kind of nice the third fundamental tactic um, i'm actually going to be going over a game that my brother played um, I've been coaching my brother, and uh, yeah, he's showed great improvement, and I recommend for him to play the Karl Khan. And I'm going to kind of rush through this game, since uh, I'm not really here to go through the game, but mainly a tactic that was shown in this game that I thought was quite impressive. And spoiler alert, the tactic that is shown is a skewer, which is another very common tactic, and I actually see it very, very often, even in high-level games, it's, it's very often... Um, especially in Naroditsky's games, you, you'll see it quite a lot in end games as well, uh, which is where a lot of players mess up. Uh, yeah, zooming through this game, and already uh, white is kind of busted because there's a tactic here. You already at least win a pawn here with d takes uh, e takes d4, um, and if you take back anyway, you have check, king moves, and you have bishop back to g3, skewering the rook to the queen. Um, it's also a pin, technically. Um, but yeah, this is this is a skewer, since it hits the queen through the rook. Um, a good example of this is um, also giving a check. For example, in endgames, when you give a check with your rook, and the, the other enemy rook is on the other side of the king, and you can recapture the rook for free. That's a very common blunder in endgames. But uh, yeah, that does it for the beginner section of the video. Now, getting started with the intermediate section of the video, we're going to be going on to opening principles. Now, I could classify this as beginner, but I'm going to put it in the intermediate section because if you're an intermediate player, you have to know opening principles. You have to kind of know how to play openings. And I'm going to give an example against the kings in the defense. Now, the reason why I think opening principles are so important against the King's Indian is because the King's Indian is a modern opening and they break the most fundamental 
opening principle, which is controlling the center, um, and most importantly with pawns. Um, and they just neglect to do that, and so they're doing with pieces, which is a little bit more flexible, but it's also less stable and uh, less concrete. And you can get simply a nice advantage against the King's Indian by using basic opening principles like controlling the center with pawns and developing your knights to the center. Um, again, they're just not doing that. Develop your knight to the center, you're controlling your pieces, uh, your pieces are controlling the center, your pawns are controlling the center, you're developing knights before bishops. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna go through a couple moves here. You're developing your bishop, and the reason you delayed your bishop is because you didn't really know where you wanted to go. Maybe a move before you put it on d3 and allowed this pin, and you had to waste time to put it back on e2. But uh, this is why you develop your knights first. It's more flexible, um, so that's that's why you do it. Um, so you have castles, castles, and guess what? You already have a almost plus one advantage simply because you use opening principles and black did not because that's just how the King's Indian is. Of course, it's still a very complex opening, but uh, the reason it's not played at top level anymore is because essentially we've figured out the strategy to beat the King's Indian defense because it's an unsound opening fundamentally. E5 and yeah. You just control the center, gain more space, pushing the pawn, d7, and yeah, now you put your bishop on e3, and again, it's playing very principled. For example, e5, you play queen d2, and this is just a very principled way to play against the king's Indian. You're going to play bishop h6, get rid of the fiend countered bishop, and you already have great attacking chances against the king's Indian setup. So yeah, that does it for the opening principles. Now for the next part of the intermediate section, we're going to be talking about pawn structure. Now I'm just going to go through an opening that I can demonstrate this quite well since I know this opening, I'm studying this opening, and uh, pawn structure happens to be quite important here. The most common move here is bishop d6, although it's not the best, and uh, this ruins black's pawn structure, and now they have a doubled pawn on the d-file, so two pawns on the d-file and one is on d6, and that's very important. So you play e3. Yep, I'm just going to go through the opening quite quickly here so I can demonstrate what happens later on. Rook to e8, and you play h3 here for a very important reason, because after e5, you play bishop back to h2. And the reason why you do this is because after e4, which seems to gain more space, kick away your, uh, your knight, um, you simply just go back, and guess what? You have a permanent target on the d6 square because the pawn is doubled and it's actually you can call it isolated as well since there's no pawns neighboring it to support it um and yeah essentially the entire game plan is targeting this weakness exploiting the fact that there is no c pawn and uh yeah for example the game can go bishop f5 c3 let's say h6 you castle um and black goes a6 you can already play queen to b3. Now the reason why this is a strong move is because first of all it targets the d5 pawn which can no longer be supported by the c pawn since it captured on d6 very early on in the game and it's also a target um, and yeah so this is quite a nice target can't be defended by another pawn and you are also targeting the b7 square um, which again it can't be supported by the, the c pawn for example can't go b6, supported by c3, um, and the bishop has moved already, so you're targeting these two pawns, which are both affected by the pawn structure, and you're also targeting this pawn. So in total, you're targeting three pawns, simply because the pawn structure is messed up for black, and uh, this lends a very easy and practical uh, game plan for white. On to the advanced section, and in the advanced section, we're going to be talking about endgames. Now, I'm not going to show you all endgames, that's impossible, but I'm going to show you an example of why you need to know endgames, and here's a very common example, king and pawn, and you have king of opposition, so this is a theoretically winning uh, endgame for white. But do you know how to win this? Because it's very instructive, and you definitely need to know how to do it, because it's actually kind of easy to mess up. So, 
essentially what you do with king opposition is once they move out of the way, you shoulder the enemy king by now controlling the square that it was on. Um, and yeah, they try and get in front of the pawn again, and you simply regain king opposition. You go back, you shoulder, they again try and get in front of the pawn, but now you can push the pawn twice um, to keep king opposition. Um, and now you keep opposition. And now either way they go, again, you shoulder the king. So they went that way, you go the other way. And now you control the promotion square. So you don't even need to worry about kings anymore. And you can simply push the pawn to promotion. I'm not going to show the rest since it's so intuitive. That does it for the end game section of the video. And on to the next section, which is prophylaxis. Now, this isn't a deep example. I I need to keep the video length quite uh, short. I can't be doing like 20 minute video. Of course, I would love to go more in depth about all of the topics, but uh, I just want to get out there uh, what you should be focusing on, what these ideas even are, and just the absolute basics. And I'm actually going to show you an opening uh, example of this, even though it can be applied to all parts of chess. Um, so openings, middle games, and end game, it can really be applied to everything. Um, prophylaxis is very important. And essentially, uh, what prophylaxis is, is when you ask yourself, what does my opponent want? And prophylaxis is acting on that uh, notion by trying to stop what your opponent is doing. Now, an opening example that I can show is uh, the Nimzo Indian. And the reason I can show this example, this is the Nimzo Indian by the way, um, is already you can use prophylaxis to kind of navigate through the opening. Let's say you don't know any theory here, um, it's absolutely fine. Because you can just look at black species and be like, okay, what do they want? What's the point of bishop b4? The point of bishop b4 is to take the knight, give up the bishop pair, which is, yeah, okay, it happens. Um, but, uh, one way you can just stop this is they want to double the pawns. One way you can stop this is by going queen to c2 and already you've stopped one of black plants. Of course, the Nimzo Indian is very complicated. This is only like the absolute bare basics of the Nimzo Indian. Um, but yeah, essentially you want to stop the doubling of the pawns and later on you can support the e4 pawn push with your queen and essentially here you, again just following you know, basic fundamental opening principles and uh yeah that'll lend you a good position against the so indian of course uh, it's still very complicated uh, but yeah at least you can get a good position just with the basic principles now on to the last chess topic that we're going to talk about today which is imbalances um, now imbalances are uh, very advanced topics and I'm actually just going to show you a grandmaster game that demonstrates this very very nicely and the main imbalance that you hear about is the bishop pair. Now in this game black decides to give up the bishop pair uh, right about here and black gives up the bishop pair. Now, it's not exactly quite clear why black did this because you aren't getting really anything in return um of course it, it's still kind of complicated um but white does a very very nice job of demonstrating why the bishop pair is so strong and why it's a good imbalance to have for your side now, this game just goes on very simply for a little bit improving positions um very uh, positional play um with a very instructive game if you just want to go through the video a little bit slower but uh, i'm going to kind of rush through to the end where white gets an absolutely massive attack utilizing the bishop pair yep just closing down the queen side real quick trading and uh, now we can start to migrate our pieces over to the king side opening up the center a little bit to open our bishops um by the way that's what you want to do when you have the bishop pair open up the positions so your bishops have scope to see like everything on the board that's their main uh, strength and yeah again we're going to start migrating our pieces over to the king side now again preparing our bishops to attack putting it back on defended squares opening files for our queen to slide over and that is precisely what we do right here 
Now this attack is already absolutely devastating. I mean, your bishop, you can like even potentially sack it later on, but uh, let's just calm it down for a second here. And yeah, rook d7, and already we strike with h5, trying to open the late squared bishop closer to the black king. And uh, yeah, black obliges by taking on h5, saying, hey, it's a free pawn. What are you going to do to me? But uh, white is not having that. And he plays rook to e3, rook lift, and rook to e1, doubling the rooks on the e-file. Very, very strong idea. And here we just make a few positional moves, uh, just solidify, solidify. And again, we slide our queen a little bit closer. We have a threat of maiden one. So uh, obviously black moves back. They are a good player, but uh, they don't have the bishop pair. Rook g3, putting more pressure on the black position and king side. Um, yeah, again, taking on h5 was devastating, but what uh, black didn't really have much of a choice. And here, black goes at knight to g6, and already white has mate in 19 with rook takes g6. And uh, yeah, this attack, the conclusion of the attack is actually the most instructive here with king to g8. I don't understand that move. Um, but yeah, e6, opening up the dark sword bishop. And of course, this is pinned, that's why this isn't a blunder. Um, and yeah, queen to d8, trying like last ditch effort to get the queen over to the queen side to defend. Um, but yeah, there's not much you can do at this point. Um, and white goes forward with f5, rook to f8, and the killer blow, f6. Now, this is devastating for quite a few reasons. The main reason though is of course there's a pin here and you're going to win a piece cool who cares the real nice threat here in my opinion for example uh let's say uh, let's say rook takes f6 now you have bishop takes and you can't do anything essentially your rooks hit skewer by the way skewer to the uh, queen it's also a pin skewer pin um i guess you can call it a skin eric rosen moment um yeah but uh essentially you have unstoppable threats of queen to h7 uh, your bishop is pinned and attacked twice your rook is pinned and skewered and you can even just bring your rook in um the top variation is queen d8 queen h7 king to f8 bishop takes g7 rook takes g7 rook f1 check king d7 yeah there's just like unstoppable mates everywhere king d8 and rook to f8 checkmate and uh yeah um, white just demonstrated absolute amazing technique using the bishop pair attacking and just technique on all aspects of the game were honestly amazing this game by white that does it for today's youtube video i hope you enjoyed listening to all these topics and i hope i at least was able to introduce you to a couple new chess topics strategies tactics etc if you like today's youtube video don't forget to leave a comment down below like and subscribe and as always i will see you in next week's youtube video